Hello, everyone. Let me whisk you in, everyone. Let me also start the video in YouTube, which is going to be live, as you know. Uh, tut -tut, live on YouTube, there you go. I'm admitting Casper. Hello, Casper. <clears throat> Hi, Casper. Thank you for joining. I just, was just saying that um, I am Angeliki as well is joining us. Hi, Angeliki. Thank you for joining. Um, So I'm just starting as well the, uh, the <clears throat> sorry, the uh, YouTube live meeting. So there you go. Up. Okay. Uh, right, so the meeting is now streaming live on YouTube as well. I mean, about two. I hope everyone is okay and everyone is having a, <clears throat> a good Friday. Um, <clears throat> A good Friday afternoon after a busy week. Um, so hi, Heinrich. Hi, um, hi, Blandine. Hello, everyone. So <clears throat> let me just check whether okay the process is still setting up on YouTube. Don redirecting to YouTube. I'm just checking whether we have some. Uh, some uh, a good Friday afternoon comers in here. Um, okay, so I suggest we get cracking if that's okay with everyone. Um, so there's going to be three parts in this webinar, in this live bet webinar as announced. The first one is going to be what is the current state of play in relation to uh, contractual relationships between studios, film studios, streamers, um, film producers and uh, actors and actresses. And the second part is going to be what are the um, contractual clauses that matter in those relationships. And then the third part will be um, how do I see the future playing out in, uh, in those relationships? So um, before we move on to what's the contemporary system for um, contractual relationships between actors and um, film studios, I suggest we have a look back at the history of this very recent um, uh, artistic endeavor and industry, which is the, 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 the movie industry, the, the film industry. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the, um, the film industry was uh, created at the end of the, um, <clears throat> of the 19th century, uh, uh, in 1825, uh, uh, if I remember well, uh, that's right, 1895, apologies, when the uh, Lumière brothers, the Frère Lumière, um, basically showcased five of a uh, short films in Paris. And so that was the beginning of this uh, film industry. And of course, um, by then the films were mute. They, I mean, act, we couldn't hear the, the actors uh, talking. It wasn't yet the time of the talkies, so it was still the silent movie era. And um, between the uh, late uh, 1900s and uh, uh, the 20s, this is where the industry really started to uh, expand, um, develop as well in Hollywood, in Southern California. Why? Uh, because the Europe, where quite a lot of uh, film directors were coming from, and also the talent, the, uh, I mean, the actors were coming from, had been stricken by two world wars um, in a very short period. So a lot of the ta uh, talent defected to the United States, coming from, in particular, Italy, Germany, they just uh, left to the US. And why Hollywood? Why South and California? Well, there was plenty of sun, which is great when you want to film. And secondly, uh, the land was cheap there. Okay, it was still a place which um, had a lot of space and uh, was still really cheap. So Hollywood really became the um, golden standard for the film industry, um, you know, around the 1920s. Um, so what we are going today to focus mainly on, 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 on what's happening in the Hollywood um, 
sort of world. Um, and I'm uh, going to focus on that as opposed to focusing on French law stuff and uh, English law stuff. OK, just to let you know. Um, so. Um, what was quite interesting is that uh, the, the, the two pillars of the uh, Hollywood uh, movie industry were the studio system and the star system. So the studio system back in the 20s was um, revolved around a, a, a small number of large movie studios and also um, smaller movie studios, which basically dominated the industry. And um, it was based on the premise that most creative personnel, in particular directors and actors, were uh, under long-term contract to their respective studios as employees. So the movie studios in the 1920s were the big five. They were div divided between the big five, uh, RKO, uh, radio pictures which has now disappeared 20th century fox which now is 21st century fox paramount pictures warner brothers these two are still around and metro goldwyn mayer which we heard yesterday is just being bought by amazon and um in addition to those big five there were also the little three uh which were universal pictures which is still around columbia pictures still around and united artists uh, which uh, is actually a dormant, uh, a dormant studio now, um, so belonging to MGM, by the way, uh, now. So um, in addition to this pillar of the studio system, there, were, there was also the star system, which was the, um, uh, the way to manage the talent. And so for actor and actresses, that meant that basically uh, the star system was a method of creating, promoting, and exploiting movie stars in Hollywood films. Um, the agents, the film exec, the studio executives, and the managers were really creating talent from scratch, um, asking uh, potential actors and actresses to actually have some, you know, um, surgical uh, surgery um, to, to change their features. Sometimes uh, change, of course, their hair color sometimes as well, and also change their stories, their backgrounds, where they were coming from. So they were basically building up these stars from scratch uh, when they thought that, you know, the screen tests were going well and uh, that they were, um, uh, they were uh, aesthetically quite pleasing. And um, hi, um, Ben, thank you for joining. So, so, um, so uh, some of the stars that actually went through the star system um, include Gary Grant, who actually was a British bloke from uh, uh, the north of England called Archibald Leach initially. Um, John Crawford, who was born uh, Lucille Fay Le Sueur, and who was coming from a very, very poor background. Um, and Rock Hudson, who was born Roy Harold Scherer. And despite the fact that he was uh, uh, starring in all these films being, you know, the um, um, the uh, epitome, ep 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 like the, the best uh, um, son-in-law that a, 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 a mother could have, he was actually extremely gay, uh, homosexual. So under the star system, the, these um, actors were literally owned by the studios as properties, and they were locked into employment contracts with a standard term of around, usually around seven, like uh, usually seven years. Uh, for which they earned a weekly wage like any other employee of a, a movie studios. And they were asked most of the time to work six days a week for long hours. Their contracts required the actors to participate in every movie and all publicity, publicity the studio desired. So they were on a very tight leash and there was definitely a sub subordination link, which meant that they, um, uh, actors and actresses were literally um, uh, the property of a studio. And so on the back of the um, of a drama uh, which which happened to a, um, a famous um, movie star called Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, uh, who was very uh, prominent in the uh, silent film era, um, the movie studios decided to actually include some morals clause or clauses or morality clauses in the actors studio contracts. And um, Universal Studio was actually the first one to 
uh, to pull the trigger and to include in the uh, templates in uh, <clears throat> the from 1921 onwards a uh, morality clause which would read as follows the actor or actress agrees to conduct himself or herself with due regard to public convention and morals and agrees that he or she will not uh, or do, will not commit anything tending to degrade himself and society or bring him or her into public hatred, contempt, scorn, or ridicule, et cetera, et cetera. So um, again, so not only were they completely owned by the studios, the, um, the actor and actresses, but due to these morals clauses, they could actually be terminated under five days notice in case for one reason or another, they were actually caught up in a scandal. Uh, so they were under, pressure, a lot of pressure all the time. And I mentioned Rock Hudson and his homosexuality before. Well, that was something that um, had to be constantly monitored and covered up. So that's why also the studios, the film studios were always organizing, you know, some dates and, uh, and PR events between uh, the male uh, young talent and also uh, female actresses. So that, you know, everybody thought that uh, everybody was uh, uh, very straight, very wide, very et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so it was very controlling, the star, the star, star system. Um, also from the 1930s to the 1960s, it was common practice for the film studios to arrange the contractual exchange of talent for loans. So for example, um, the very famous uh, film director Hitchcock, Alfred, Alfred Hitchcock, got lent by his um, studio, which uh, was man, uh, ed, headed by um, a very famous uh, uh, producer, David, David O. Selznick, to many other film studios. And this is where he produced you know, the likes of Rebecca's and um, plenty of other films that he did. So lending the talent, especially directors and actor and actresses was really something that happened very often in the star system. So things started to unravel when James Cagney, who was a very prominent um, male star at uh, Warner, Warner Brothers, uh, decided to sue Jack Warner and uh, the Warner Brothers for breach of contract. So what happened there? Well, firstly, there was quite a lot of complications between Cagney and Jack Warner because Cagney wanted to have his salary increase because he was the top, you know, top uh, uh, male star at uh, Warner Brothers and he wanted to be paid on a par with stars like um, Edward J. Robertson, D Douglas Fairbanks and uh, Kay Francis at four grand per week. And so uh, that was actually settled through a mediation, which was um, managed by uh, the film director, Frank Capra. And for a while, things were okay between uh, Warner, the Warner Brothers and, uh, and James Cagney. And so Cagney produced quite a lot of films. And as part of the deal that um, uh, Frank Capra uh, uh, struck as, as a mediator, he was to be paid 3,000 grand per week um, and he would be guaranteed top billing and he would have to do no more than four films a year for Warner Brothers. However, Jack Warner didn't uh, hold to his part of the bargain. And um, when the fourth, fifth film actually that um, Cagney shot in um, the year 1934, so that was already a breach because um, he filmed five films instead of four. Um, so when the fifth the title, Ceiling Zero was released, Cagney discovered that he was not um, on the billboards in Los Angeles. He wasn't top billing. Um, his co-star, Pat O'Brien, was actually above him. Um, so that was a second breach to the, uh, to the settlement agreement which had been struck, and therefore Cagney uh, sued Warner Brothers, and he won. So that was the first realization from the talent that actually you could take on the studios and actually won if you had a good lawyer. Uh, Cagney was represented by his brother, by the way, w William Cagney, um, during the trial. And uh, so I was a winning team, these Cagney brothers. And so um, what happened after that is that some other uh, stars, this time female, decided to follow suit. Unsuccessfully for Bet Betty Davis, the very famous and um, incisive actress, Bet Betty Davis. So what happened there? Well, she slammed the door when uh, uh, behind her when Jack Warner asked her to act as a lumberjack 
in her next feature film. She was like, okay, I'm signed on a seven years contract with you guys at Warner Brothers, but I'm not going to play a, 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 a lumberjack in my next movie. So bye-bye, I'm off to England to actually film, you know, two feature films with uh, British directors there. And so while she was in England shooting, she was served with uh, court papers in England for breach of contract by Warner Brothers because they were like, eh, you've got your seven years contract, you're not finished. And she turned around and she said, well, it's finished. It's, it's, it was a 52 weeks contract. And I've been with you, you know, from, from a calendar, uh, uh, calendar uh, year standpoint, I've been with you seven years, 52 weeks. So what, what's, what's going on here? And Warner Brothers said, no, actually, if you look at the small print in your contract, in your um, studio contract, you will see that all the period during which you were not uh, shooting, you were suspended because you didn't want to play in that or that role. Well, all this adds up, these periods of where you're not actually effectively working for the studio, all these uh, periods add up at the end of a seven years, a 52 weeks period. And then this is, you know, the outstanding amount of time you have to work for Warner Brothers. So she was baffled. And, um, and so she made some counterclaims in front of the English court. And um, she uh, was actually branded by the British press as being a uh, uh, someone who you know takes advantage of the situation and is ungrateful, because um, the barrister representing Warner Brothers said that uh, um, if he also was receiving uh, one thousand three hundred fifty dollars per week, um, he also would like to be uh, put in a situation of slavery. Um, as Ms. Beth Davis was alleging that she was uh, a, a, a subject of. So um, she lost her case in, in front of the English, English court. And she also got quite uh, broke because of legal fees. And she moved back to the US and started, uh, resumed working for Warner Brothers. Actually, Jack Warner was quite cool about it. He, after, after she came back to uh, the US, Betty Davis um, started shooting a string of, of excellent uh, films, and that was one of the best career, you know, moments in in her career after this. But anyway, she lost that 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 uh, lawsuit. However, a very different fate happened to Olivia de Havilland of um, Gone with the Wind fame, and, and when she also sued Jack Warner and Warner Brothers. Um, because she, again, she refused to have the time during which she was absent or suspended added at the end of her seven year contract. And she sued in the US this time in California and um, on, on the grounds of slavery or, or something which is called peonage, basically the fact that, you know, seven years and you can't move, get out of a contract. So, so this time around actually um, the, the court uh, took a, uh, a, a way more employee-friendly decision and found in the favor of the Avaland that indeed um, uh, contracts which could only be enforceable under California law for up to seven calendar years and that uh, in this case, the Avaland was in a situation was of, uh, in a form of peonage. The, her, her actress contract was a form of peonage or illegal servitude. That's what the court said, and it was um, confirmed in, um, in appeal. So um, in a big splashy headline, Variety noting the ruling declared on the 15th of March, 1944, the Avaland free agent. And that is exactly what happened after this mid forties period, which is that the movies, uh, the movie stars and the, the actors and actresses started to actually realize that perhaps they were better off as free agents, as opposed to employees of the studios. And from the, uh, the, the Avalon law, because this is how it was branded, this, um, this lawsuit, uh, 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 Olivia de Avalon versus Warner Brothers, it was called the, the and is still called the Avilion Law. Um, from this moment onwards, the floodgates opened, and the studios just um, uh, could not control their talent in such a, 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 a very firm and uh, and, um, and tough way than before. So the contemporary system, which is the system which happened between you know around the starting in the nineteen fifties up to. Um, up to, I'd say, the mid-noughties, 
This is the contemporary system, and that's where actors and actresses regain power and took control of a professional destiny. Um, uh, another star who actually, you know, um, really uh, uh, pushed uh, in the direction started by Betty Davis and uh, Olivia de Havilland was Shirley MacLaine, who in 1959 sued her, uh, her uh, famed producer, Hal Wallace, with whom she was working for a contractual dispute uh, which also further contributed to the star system's demise. And then again, in, um, in 1966, um, Shirley MacLaine sued 20th Century Fox because they had reneged on, uh, on um, their agreement to star MacLaine in a film version of a Broadway musical called Bloomed Plumer Girl. Um, and um, they had proposed another title to be shot in Australia, like a Western, uh, for her instead, but she refused, and um, and so therefore she sued 20th Century Fox in the uh, famous case called Shirley MacLaine Parker versus 20th, 20th Century Film, Fox Film Corp, and she won. Uh, so she won, and um, this uh, case is actually often cited in old school textbooks. So what is the contemporary system? Well, the contemporary system is that um, the top talent now uh, very often creates their own film production companies or they uh, nurture some particular film projects they are very keen to work on. And um, so the likes of Brad Pitt and Robert Redford, Reese Witherspoon, Clint Eastwood, Bradley Cooper, Will Smith, all have their, uh, film, their own film production companies and in, in, in which they, they basically develop uh, stories, scripts, hire writers, um, find directors to shoot these films. Sometimes they even themselves, they are their own directors, such as Clint Eastwood and Bradley Cooper, uh, Robert Redford, I think. And, um, and yeah, and so, so they really become really well-rounded uh, film experts because they no longer only do the, film, the, the acting, but they basically become film producers in their own right. Um, and um, yeah, and so what happened is that because this, the, power, the, 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 the balance of power has now shifted uh, or, or be, between the um, 1950s and, and the early noughties, it really shifted back to the talent, to the actors and actresses. What the studio decided to do is to offer um, first look contracts to these, to these stars uh, so that, um, so that they would keep, you know, some, some, like a, a little bit of control over over all these uh, these stars' output. So, a first look contracts is, for example, um, Universal Studio is going to uh, um, give you know some fees and access to office spaces on the studio lot to uh, Plan B Entertainment. Um, uh, the, the Plan B Entertainment Company, which is which in Brad Brad Pitt Brad Pitt's film production company, and when a um, a title is is being developed, then Universal Studio has the first option to produce or distribute the movies um, that the, the Brad Pitt has pursued. This is just an example, and it's not from uh, real life. It's just an example. I have no idea whether Black, Brad Pitt and uh, Universal Studio work together. It's just an example of what a first look contracts um, is and uh, and entails. So, so this is really now the, the way that a lot of big stars are working. You know, with these first look contracts, and um, and uh, um, and they really have. Also, because they've got some power agents, you know, with the likes of uh, WME, or, uh, William Morris Entertainment, or Creative um, uh, something agency, Creative CAA, and uh, and and they can broker some massive deals, really, really strong deals. But this was so um, so. How can I say? Extreme in the mid mid noughties that actually the studios were losing money every time they were hiring a top talent to, um, to, 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 to shoot in a film. So yes, of course, 
the um, the studios would get you know a, a decent turnover, uh, like return at the box office on all these titles. But the fact is that because the star uh, was uh, getting such a, a, a large part of uh, of all the receipts and the, the box office receipts, and, and and also of course up front they were being paid a salary, but very often they also had a share in the um, in the, 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 the you know the the, the uh, income uh, generated at the box office and also uh, later on in that, during the long tail, that the uh, the, the studios were basically um, not making any 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 profit out of his out of his stars. So you you can read this um, um, situation quite well in the book called Blockbusters: Why Big Hits and Big Risks Are the Future of an Entertainment uh, Business, which I mentioned in my article. Let me just uh, uh, send you a link to that, and you will see that um, um, you will see that basically, uh, yeah, the uh, uh, the stars were perhaps taking too uh, too much advantage of a system um, where where they were they were like the the tables had run had, had turned, and uh, and so it was extreme. Um, one really interesting, flamboyant example of this, uh, this um, rise of the power of factors was actually Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise had a stellar career as a, an actor, of course, especially when uh, he started being discovered in Top Gun in 1986. He went on to do some um, really, really uh, lauded uh, uh, films such as Rain Man and the Born on the Fourth of July. But then with his uh, uh, then agent, uh, Paula Wagner, who had actually signed him at CNA, CIA and represented him for 11 years, uh, uh, they decided, Paula Wagner and Tom Cruise, to actually um, found an independent film production company called Cruise Wagner Productions in July 1992 to develop their own projects. And this is what they did for the next 13 years, successfully for uh, the first three films of the Mission Impossible franchise. And they also did Vanilla Sky, Min Minority Report, et cetera, et cetera. And um, things were going well uh, up until Tom Cruise did a, um, uh, an interview with uh, Oprah in which he was um, <clears throat> not at his best and said things which were inappropriate. So the chairman of Viacom who was the, uh, the parent company of uh, Paramount Pictures with whom uh, Cruz and Wagner had actually signed a, um, a, um, a first look contract, uh, decided to terminate the deal. And uh, further to that, um, Cruz, Cruz got actually very lucky despite his reputation, which was started to go down doldrums. He, he, he was approached by the, um, the chairman, the CEO uh, and chairman of MGM, um, Harry Sloan, who offered him a deal to actually resuscite United Artists that I mentioned before as one of the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the little free studios uh, from the, uh, the star system. And so he was um, offered to, uh, uh, by Harry Sloan, uh, Tom Cruise, to, uh, to run United, uh, United Artists and um, to resuscite it and to also work on his own projects. He didn't even have to start these projects. MGM would actually finance these projects. He wouldn't have to have them uh, greenlit by um, MGM if they uh, didn't um, uh, cost more than $60 million. And um, yeah, he could develop up to six films a year. So it seemed like an absolute great deal and it was probably a, a deal which was coined by Harry Sloan because he wanted to be able to uh, work with a talent without having to uh, pay them so much. So, um, so uh, the, the deal with MGM and Tom Cruise did not work out it, uh, it, because Wagner left the, uh, left the ship after two years. But it was an interesting example of his pinnacle of, uh, of power by the uh, actor and actresses in up to the mid noughties. Um, and so where do we stand now? What is the situation now? What is the current state of play? Well, as you all know, the, uh, the streamers of, uh, of uh, the streaming companies such as uh, Amazon Prime and Netflix have now um, come to the fore and, as, and they are co-competitors to the mo movie studios, to the film studios to a degree, although now there seem to be also some, uh, some links because as we've heard, uh, yesterday, Amazon is buying 
sorry, Amazon is buying MGM, as I just mentioned, and um, a movie studio, which had a lot of fame, but was now a, 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 not as famous as before, but still has an excellent catalog of a lot of titles. So, so basically the streamers came to the, um, in, into the industry and that created a lot of competition um, uh, and also that this, it, it reinforced the, the power of, um, of, the, um, of, of the film producers and, and the film studios. And also I think that a lot of um, uh, the management from the uh, streaming, studios, streaming companies, such as Netflix, Amazon, et cetera, they all come from the tech world right from the IT and tech world and, and internet world. And so I think when they saw how um, extreme the balance of po power was uh, tilting towards the talent, towards the actors and actresses, they decided to um, reshuffle the cards and um, get this, power, uh, this, this uh, 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 balance of power back to them. And they became very aggressive, the, um, the, streaming, um, the streaming companies in, uh, in basically um, reining in the talent. So uh, one thing that I need to mention is, of course, uh, initially the streaming companies were mostly distributors. They were distributing films. Actually, Netflix started as uh, distributing, uh, I think, cassettes and DVDs or something like that. That's what it started at, uh, as sorry, uh, 25 years ago, as it was just uh, you know selling DVDs and stuff. But we've when they created Netflix, created their platform online. Um, and started to have so many submissions, people uh, uh, taking memberships, monthly memberships, they started to have lots of cash coming in back to, to, to their, uh, um, into their pockets. So they needed to invest that cash, right? What did they do? Well, they, so that's why they went into content production. They started to become also film producers and content creators, but that, that was not the first step. The first step was to be solely distribution. And then once they mastered that stage, well, then started to deploy the um, membership schemes in like 190 countries in the world. I think today, uh, the only places where you can't have Netflix are China, Iran, and Syria, right? All the other countries you can get Netflix. Oh, probably now Russia is no longer on the list. Um, yeah, that's right. Netflix stopped uh, uh, its subscription in uh, in Russia, but um, so um, all this cash coming in, and um, and they started to redeploy it in the business by going into content production. As I'm sure you remember, around five five six years ago, we started to be you know all us, the audience, the customers, we started to be really in awe at the, uh, the various um, series in particular that they were producing, such as Versailles. Um, more recently, the Queen's Gambit, um, and um, et cetera, et cetera, little things, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so that means that uh, since there are more players and also more dominant players in the uh, studio slash film production um, uh, uh, space, it means also that the there's it's it's less easy for big stars to impose their terms, okay? Because another thing also that the uh, uh, the streamers did and the, uh, is that they um, the they um, also decided to recruit a lot of new talent so that it wouldn't cost them too much. So as opposed to taking um, uh, already known talent who immediately wants to impose their conditions and their terms. So at the moment, the system is that um, the balance of power is shifting back to the film studios and the streamers. Um, and I'm going to explain to you in a second how, um, how they are uh, basically doing this from a contract standpoint. Do you guys have any questions? Are there any um, comments that um, you want to make or... Uh, want to questions you, that you want to ask now is the time if you want to unmute yourself or if you want to ask them in the chat box don't hesitate so let me have a look at our audience on uh, on uh, um youtube so melanie is asking um 
do you need an agent to negotiate your contract? Yes, yes. As an actor and, or an actress, you definitely need to uh, um, uh, basically uh, uh, get an agent to be represented. And usually the agents you meet um, if you um, if you are uh, based in uh, in locations where you um, where there are some uh, various film schools. If you go to a film school like Rada in um, in um, the UK or the Cours Florent in Paris in France, then usually the agents are swarming around like flies and they want to sign you on. Um, that is actually usually better than unsolicited. Um, um, unsolicited you know uh, uh, calls and uh, and emails uh, but yes in in the film industry you do need an agent although I heard that um, Angus Mac Angus Cloud who is the new talent from the euphoria uh, series was actually um, uh, spotted by an agent while he was working in a McDonald's you know Angus Cloud uh, plays Fez the drug dealer in euphoria and apparently he was uh, he was uh, spotted while he was working in the McDonald's as a as a McDonald guy, so um, he definitely didn't have an agent. So sometimes we have some good surprises like this, but um, uh, after, now I'm sure Angus Cloud does have an agent, for example. Okay, so let's move on. So let's talk about the um, the contractual aspect of uh, of um, of the. Um, the contractual aspect of the relations between actors, actresses, and, um, and film studios and streamers. So in the American system, um, there is a differentiation that you have to make um, in relation to whether, to, uh, to, to whether the film production is a, a signatory of a Screen Actors Guild, which is a, a guild which uh, uh, um, basically was created to represent actors. So if a film production is a signatory to the Screen Actors Guild, it, and it is almost always the case in the US, um, then the first question that you have to ask yourself is whether the actor is guaranteed $65,000 or more in total compensation for acting services by this particular film production company or no. So if the um, actor is guaranteed $65,000 or more, then this actor will fall under the Schedule F for Freddie, Schedule F of the SAC Basic, agree basic Agreement, um, which, um, it, 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 is, which, which there is a link to in my article um, that I've sent you the link of. And so um, the film production company will be free to negotiate many employment provisions that would otherwise be set in stone by the guild, by the SAG Screen Actors Guild, um, including overtime and meal breaks and scheduling and minimum daily or weekly compensation uh, if this actor is a Schedule F actor. And so if the actor is not a Schedule F actor, then um, you refer to such an actor as a daily or weekly actor. So the two most important deal points when hiring a Schedule F actor or any kind of actor any, uh, in, in the US are the compensations and the scheduling. With respect to the scheduling, it is often overlooked, although it is very important, this point about um, scheduling. An actor is uh, someone who is selling his or her time. And actors will not make a binding commitment to block out time for a film production and therefore pass on other opportunities unless they are guaranteed payment, even if you end up not using them. So they also cannot make an indefinite commitment to a film production. So unless the studio is paying a sizable sum in guaranteed compensation, the actor will expect some kind of guaranteed date after which he or she can accept new work without having to get the studio's approval first. So an important negotiation point in an actor's deal revolves around the total number of days or weeks that the film production will need the actor to actually render services, the re rehearsals and the shooting days, et cetera. And also the window of time in which the film company needs the actor to be available to them. So for example, will, they, will the film production need Will the film production need three consecutive weeks of service, commencing, commencing within two weeks before or after a specific date? 
within which the services will be, be will be rendered. So these are points of negotiation that um, actors, agents, and film production film producers do negotiate. So as production schedules change frequently, especially on independent production and or if a director is relatively inexperienced, the film production or movie studio needs to negotiate for some additional free days that can be used consecutively with principal photography, as well as some free days non-consecutive to principal photography where the film production company can bring the actor back to post-production work. For example, to reshoot some scenes or to do some dialogue replacement or some dubbing. So, the actor's representatives, i.e. the agents or the lawyers, will probably require that after the scheduled days and free days are exhausted, the actor will be entitled to uh, overage compensation at the same rate as a fixed compensation, re uh, which represents uh, um, in relation to the originally scheduled period of services. In other words, if an actor is paid $100,000 for 10 days of scheduled work, and then agree to do to do to two free days, but the production requires five days beyond the originally scheduled ten. Then the actors would be entitled to thirty thousand dollars in other ages. Why? Because the first two free days are in, included in the um, in the deal, um, but then the additional three days, uh, uh, free number three free days need to be paid um, at the same rate of $10,000 per day. So that's $30,000. So you see this scheduling um, uh, contractual issue is extremely important because the actor needs to be able to know um, exactly how long this particular film project is going to take him or her and, uh, and then move on to the next, uh, to the next project. And the other um, uh, very, uh, very, um, heavily discussed and negotiated aspect of a, of a film contract with an actor is the compensation, of course. So there's fixed compensation, which is usually the first uh, deal point discussed. For Schedule F actors, it is usually a fixed amount payable in equal weekly installments over the schedule period of the actor's services, with overages payable at the same rate for any services required beyond the originally scheduled days and any agreed free days, as we just discussed. So the actor's agent will often negotiate for the fixed compensation to be put in escrow with the agency or uh, agencies or law firms trust accounts before the actor even travels to ensure the production, the film production, actually has the ability to pay the agreed amount. Um, if the escrow is agreed by the film production company, then it will need to enter into an escrow agreement with the agency or law firm. So such escrow agreement must provide that the agency law firm will suspend payments in the event the actor is suspended or terminated pursuant to the terms of the uh, actor agreement. So um, it is best practice for the film production company to only deposit the actor's fixed compensation in escrow once the acting and um, escrow agreements are duly execu uh, fully executed. So you see, um, I think this is due to the, uh, to the rather sometimes um, elusive nature of film productions. But uh, this point about, you know, about having the salary of this compensation put in an escrow account is uh, very often um, you know, um, negotiated and agreed on by, um, by the, um, uh, the actor's representative and, uh, and the film production company. So, uh, so that is the first point about compensation. And the second compensation point is the contingent compensation. As I mentioned before, um, with the shifting of power going back, of the balance of power going back to the, um, to the, to the uh, film stars, um, uh, the biggest stars are usually allocated a contingent compensation, which could take the form of the box office bonuses or gross participations or deferments or um, net participations. And, um, and therefore, um, they are entitled, these, uh, these um, uh, actress, actors and actresses, to a, um, a share in the, um, in the box office receipts um, that um, the film production company will, will get. So uh, on a pragmatic basis, usually it is a uh, collection account management company 
that collects and administers all of the revenues of a project and, um, and, um, and, and then allocates and pays the applicable participations and deferments. And, um, and yeah, and so that, that, that is why um, there are so many, you know, there, this is why we, we still have the, um, uh, all this information in the trades, in the uh, tr trade journals about all these box office receipts, because they usually give you also an indication of how much a film star is going to be paid as per his or her uh, contingent compensation on the project. And for weekly and daily actors, the film production can continue to employ them as long as it continues paying them at the negotiated daily or weekly rate, provided that the actor has not negotiated a specific stop date or similar or something similar. The negotiation is, uh, is easier with uh, daily and weekly um, actors because, because actually there's not really a negotiation and also the rates are what it is. So, um, so it's just like standard uh, term agreements that are being signed with the uh, daily weekly actors and um, the next issue which is being negotiated between the film production companies and uh, the actors are uh, credits so the re relative position of actors credits is determined by negotiation but usually depends on the size of the role and the stature of the actors. So what do I mean by credit? Well, I'm sure uh, you know what it is when you're going to watch a film and sometimes you've got um, either on the uh, trailers or on the billboards or on advertisement in news newspapers or also at the beginning of the um, of a film if the um, if a film start, starts, you know, with uh, with various credits, well, this is this is what we're talking about these credits. And so, if the, the more prominent the star is, the more his or her name is going to be at the top and also at the beginning of the credits, right? Um, and so, this is what is negotiated after, as I said, um, scheduling and compensation. The credit is the third most important point. Um, so if a film project has two main characters, the biggest star will often get first position credit and the other actor will be in second position. This is actually the problem we discussed earlier with James Cagney, not having, uh, was, which, who was supposed to have top billing on his four films per year with uh, Warner Brothers. So um, the distributor of a picture will also have specific opinions about who needs to be used for marketing purposes to help sell the picture. And the film production company needs to liaise efficiently with the distributor's marketing department in order to clarify what kind of credit can be given for, to the actors while retaining top marketability and revenues maximizing. So as a, an agent or lawyer for the, uh, for the film star, for the, the actor, you often have to negotiate with, um, with a lawyer for the film production uh, 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 company and film studio and they often uh, are going to ask you to wait because they need to check with marketing uh, you know whether we can uh, give your client uh, the right to be top billing to be at the top of the credits or so 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 it's going to be an interesting ping pong party like back and forth between um between this marketing department and and your client you know so that they agree on the on the billing on the credit positions um also, it's customary to agree that an actor will have a right to approve a still photographs that will be used in the marketing of a picture, um, with the actor required to approve at least 50% of stills in which they appear alone and 75% of stills in which they appear with others who have approval rights. And um, yes, under the SAG rules, um, actors have a right of prior written approval over any scenes that require them or they double to appear nude or as engaging in sexual conduct. The actor's representatives will often ask that the contract set this out explicitly, including specific descriptions of the scenes being filmed and limitations on what can and cannot be shot. So this is also really quite tightly um, uh, regulated. I need to um, quickly mentioned the pay or play concept, which um, has been created to protect above the line talents, such as in actors and actresses, uh, from being terminated without receiving their full fixed fee. So in the actor's agreement, the parties will agree that at a certain point in the production process, often well before principal photography starts, the talent becomes pay or play. 
And um, if they are subsequently terminated without cause, they will be entitled to the entire fixed fee, regardless of whether it has accrued at the moment of termination. So since the actors have blocked out their schedules for this pro pro production, they want to ensure that they will be compensated for that time, even if a producer decides to uh, go a different direction or the production does not move forward. So the contract will set out that the talent can be terminated at any time for any reason, with or without cause, but if a talent has become pay or play uh, and is then terminated for any reason other than force majeure and or the talent's default or disability, then the actor will be entitled to a full fee. That is the concept of pay or play. Um, typically, a contract will say that the talent becomes pay or play on the earlier of commencement of principal photography or the hiring company electing to proceed to production of a picture with the actor in the specified role. And um, it's uh, uh, this concept of pay or play needs to be put in parallel with the concept of pay and play, uh, which is uh, uh, reserved to film directors. In the pay and play concept, actually uh, the director is not only guaranteed to his or her compensation, but also has the right to render the services without being suspended or terminated, unless for cause, for a specified period of time. So for actors, the best you can get is pay or play. And for directors, you can even get pay and play where you he or she cannot be suspended. So anyway, that's a, a, an interesting point. So that, that is uh, one of the also very critical um, uh, uh, contractual clauses which are being discussed and negotiated in, in contracts agreements. Now, what do I think about uh, the future of um, the negotiation between um, actors, actresses, the ad agents and, and lawyers, and the film production companies, the film studios, and the streaming uh, services? Well, I think it's going to be tougher for the talent to, um, uh, 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 to request um massive uh, massive salaries and uh, and um um contingent uh, contingent compensation uh one i'm saying this is because as i'm sure you know the streaming companies do not uh disclose the box office results in the sense that even when the film is um um broadcasted on the day and date uh, release, uh, which means that it's uh, going to be dis available to view on the platform, Netflix, for example, but it's also going to be available to view in cinemas and theaters near you. So that's called day and date release. So even when films are released by Netflix or Amazon Prime on the day and date um, uh, uh, option, they these these uh, streamers still do not disclose the um, the um, box office receipts, and therefore that means that uh, the talent, um, the actors in particular, cannot have any access to contingent 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 uh, compensation, as in box office bonuses or deferment or uh, gross participation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that is not going to change it. I, I don't think that um, there's no reason why if the Netflix and Amazon Prime of this world wants to dis disclose their box office receipts. Um, they don't have to and, um, and they don't want to do it. So the concept uh, when a, a, a streamer like Netflix um, decides to actually uh, be involved in a project, in a film uh, production project, is that they will only um, uh, buy it um, on, a, on a fixed fee. They will not, as I said, um, provide any type, type of contingent compensation, but uh, to, to, um, uh, to anyone, like not only to the, to, the, to the actors and the actresses, but also to the, to the independent film production that works with them. So they will finance the, the film, but then the film producers, the actors and actresses, they will not get any... Um, any contingent uh, uh, compensation. And so this type of digital licenses 
which are basically distribution agreements where um, uh, where, where, where Netflix acquires all worldwide rights in perpetuity to a motion picture prior to production, and which will be built a Netflix original. Um, it's a way to make a fixed buyout payment with no additional net profits, royalties, or other accountings. So they can be very secretive about the results, about how many people viewed the, uh, the title, either online on their platform, or in theaters, they don't disclose anything, and they don't have to because they don't they don't have to give you know accounts to anyone after after it's been it's been released, and um, and that of course has a trigger effect with movie studios and um, and big film production companies who are annoyed that they still have to disclose their box office results and. Uh, and pay contingent compensation to their stars, right? So I'm sure you've heard about this case recently where Scarlett Johansson, Johansson, Scarlett Johansson sued uh, the Walt Disney Company, Walt Disney, um, over what she claimed was a breach of contract after Disney chose to release the Marvel superhero movie, Black Widow, on a date and date release um, uh, scenario. And so that means that uh, Black Widow was released by Disney in theaters as well as on the same day online on its D Disney Plus streaming platform. And Johansson said that due to that, her large part of the salary, which was the contingent compensation, was never paid to her. And her lawyers, she said in her submissions, you know, in her, in her summons, um, approached Disney, the Walt Disney Company, to renegotiate this part of the deal because they knew that if the uh, Black Widow uh, title was released on a day and date um, scenario, then um, Scarlett Johansson would not get paid her normal uh, contingent compensation. So she sued and it actually never uh, went to the discovery stage because they decided to settle after quite a lot of uh, careful fall and uh, uh, Disney saying in the press that uh, Johansson was very, um, uh, ungrateful, et cetera, et cetera, because she's had already been paid $20 million of, uh, of uh, 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 fixed compensation. And so they settled for allegedly uh, the uh, sum of $40 million that was paid by Disney to Johansson. So that is an example uh, of, of, um, of this, you know, this, 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 this struggle, this power struggle going on, which is due to the fact that the streaming companies don't bother offering any uh, contingent compensation to their, to, their, uh, to their actors and actresses. And so the film studios are even um, now have their own streaming services, I'm sure you know, for example, Universal, um, NBC Universal has got Peacock. They also have Sky, uh, Sky because Sky belongs now to NBC Universal. Disney has got Disney Plus, as I just mentioned. HBO has got um, HBO Plus with a very, very um, a good and uh, successful series, Euphoria, for example. And so um, Paramount has got Paramount Plus. So they all have this, uh, these streaming services. And now they want to actually change the terms of how the, um, the, the series as well as uh, uh, feature films are going to be um, to be showed on there and also how much they are going to pay the talent for broadcasting these, um, these um, uh, new series and feature films on their own streaming uh, platforms. Because post COVID, it's I don't I think that most people still don't really want to go to cinemas and theaters. So uh, for like two hours with strangers with no mask, I don't think so. So basically, the rise of the streaming platforms is going to be more and more important. It fits the lifestyle of people. People want to be at home cocooning and being able to view their stuff when and uh, how they want it. And um, and um, yeah, and the actor and actresses need to up their game as to how they can successfully negotiate with these um, uh, streaming companies and also these film studios, which are reinventing themselves as streamers, um, how can, they can be paid. Um, another cause of concern 
that agents and um, actors have uh, uh, recently mentioned is the use of non-disclosure agreements non and NDAs in, in, in casting, which is increasing enormously in the industry, uh, probably due to the fact that uh, producers during the um, lockdowns, etc., were sending scripts and um, information about um, roles uh, through URL links and uh, we transfer files uh, by email. And, um, and therefore, they wanted to make sure that it will not be, you know, spread out in uh, online and on social media by uh, uh, the, uh, the people receiving the recipients of these various emails. So they bypassed the agents, the these film producers, and um, they asked the uh, actors and actresses to uh, sign very, very stringent NDAs. Um, and then once those NDAs are signed, then they would send directly the link to all these files, to the script, to um, uh, and various information about the film, uh, the film projects directly to the actors and actresses, um, uh, bypassing the act, the agents, the agents. So the agents were annoyed because uh, they were not able to see the scripts anymore. They were not able to discuss the projects with their own clients, with the actors and actresses, and they were basically completely left out of the loop. Um, of um, of a negotiation process between these film producers and their own clients. So uh, there was quite a lot of kerfuffle in the press um, one or two months ago, which I mentioned also in my article um, about actors agreement, where where uh, the, uh, a lot of um, agents were complaining about this because of course if you don't have an agent at your side uh, negotiating for you and with you your actors agreement well, you're definitely not going to have the best terms. So, um, but in this case, the, the actors and actresses, um, especially for series, you know, uh, by HBO, by, um, by Netflix and all the other streamers, they are forced into doing this, basically it's just almost like a take it or leave it situation. And, um, and so, yeah, my view on the future is that, um, Actors and uh, actresses are becoming are going to be to, 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 to go back to the stage where they were commodities, and that is going to be emphasized also by the fact that they are going to be more and more virtual uh, uh, stars. You know, especially with the advancement of AI, so um, tech companies and film production companies will actually be able to probably create some uh, um, very realistic looking um, AI made actors and actresses and, and, and create stories with his um, virtual uh, talent and it's not going to cost them a dime. And in fact, they will completely own them because they will own the uh, intellectual property rights over these AI uh, powered um, actors, virtual actors and actresses. Um, and actually it's interesting to see that Netflix has, is making a, uh, a foray into the world of gaming uh, recently acquired a, a Swedish gaming company, uh, which is going to be, you know, mentioned in my uh, next article on this topic of gaming, and that they are next fix in particular is looking at, um, you know, animes, artificial intelligence, and virtual actors by um, being very close to the Japan uh, 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 film industry, who is quite advanced on that, and. Um, yeah, so I think it's going to further decrease the cost of talent for streaming platforms, and um, that it's definitely something that um, uh, actors, actresses, and their agents need to think. How can they become themselves indispensable? Uh, how can they, sorry, make themselves indispensable, uh, but at the same time, um, uh, you know, strike a, a reasonably good deal with uh, with um, the streamers, film studios, and um, and uh, film production companies. So I am done with my presentation. Uh, do you have any questions or comments? If you want to unmute yourself, or if you want to, uh, um, if you want to um, uh, ask a question in the uh, in the chat box, don't hesitate. Okay, great. So thank you so much for attending, everyone. It was um, a pleasure uh, to uh, spend this uh, Friday afternoon with you, and I wish you a lovely weekend. Bye from Krufovi. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.